Hello, everybody. I've had to put my glasses on because I can't read without them. My name is Liz Green. I'm from BBC Local Radio right here in Yorkshire. First of all, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. I'm going to be sharing this debate uh, and our central question that we're talking about this evening. Will COVID cause divisions in Yorkshire or can we get through this together? Well, this event is part of the Talk Together, which is the UK's biggest conversation on what unites and divides us and how we can build a more connected society. It's been coordinated by the think tank British Future as part of the Together Coalition. And Talk Together is hosting conversations with people in Yorkshire this week and next, and then in every nation and region in the UK. Now, everybody is invited to take part. There is an online survey which we would urge you to fill in. If you would, it would be fantastic. Just go to together.org.uk and fill in that survey for us. We would be grateful. Now, we're all together. If you're going to be using Twitter to comment or to ask a question this evening, please use the hashtag talk together, one word, talk together, to ask a question whilst we are together on this webinar, there is a Q&A box on your screen in front of you. You can type your question into there and we encourage you to do so. And uh, you can also tag us on social media at British Future and at Talk Together. So thank you very much if you're able to use those various bits of identity. We are also streaming live on YouTube where it will be posted afterwards. Um, and again, I would ask you just to use the hashtags talk together there as well. So thank you very much. So just a quick word on how we're going to proceed. In a moment, I'm going to introduce, they're here somewhere, your panel to you. Um, I'd like to thank you all very much for taking your time and bringing your expertise to this webinar this evening. It is really much appreciated. Thank you very much. Then our panelists will answer some questions and they are very happy to take questions, not only from me, but from you as well. If you wish to ask a question, go back to it. On that screen, you'll see the little Q&A to type in your questions as we talk together. Get it. Um, the themes we're talking about today are being dealt with, I believe, by many different communities in very many different ways right around the country. So if you've seen anything that's distinctive and positive, strengths here in Yorkshire, communities coming together, and maybe using a WhatsApp little group to get together with people who are not just next door, but might be across the place where you live. Also dealing with loneliness, something I know is a really big factor for many people during this lockdown stroke, not lockdown period. Young people welcoming them back to our Yorkshire universities this week and really how all that is affecting us. So I hope that's nice and clear. We're going to start from hearing from our panel. So each of our panelists are going to talk for about five minutes. Kari Asim was due to be with us this evening. I'm very sorry. He sends his apologies. He has a family situation he has to deal with, and he would have done his very best. I know he did to be with us. So my apologies that Kari won't be here. Each panelist is going to talk for five minutes, then questions when they've all given their perspective. And don't forget the hashtag talk together on social media and use that Q&A section on the screen to ask your question. So let me introduce your panel to you. They're gonna talk for about five minutes from their perspective on our question, will COVID cause division in Yorkshire or can we get through this together? Our first panelist this afternoon or this evening is Ken Ledbeater, ambassador for the Joe Cox Foundation, chair of the More in Common, Batley and Spen, and sister of the late Joe Cox MP. You're very welcome, Kim, thank you. Good evening, Liz. Thank you so much for that introduction and good evening to everybody out there. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening. You probably had 10 different Zoom webinars that you could choose from tonight. So I'm very pleased that you've chosen to join us. Um, and well done to everybody who's been involved in organising tonight. You've already managed to get Bradford City, Huddersfield Town, and I know there are definitely some Leeds United fans tuning in. So you've managed to get us together already. So we're already embracing the talk together and more in common spirit. So well done. Okay, so where are we at? Are we divided? Are we united? What the heck's going on across Yorkshire and beyond? Um, 
for those people that know me, they'll know that I've spent the last four years since Joe's horrific murder trying to make a difference uh, locally and nationally in her name. And a lot of what we do is indeed about bringing people together. Um, and we're inspired and um, driven by the words that Joe said in her maiden speech in Parliament, where she said that we have more in common than that which divides us. It's become a quite an iconic phrase that a lot of people have clung onto in, in challenging times. And we've certainly had a, quite a few of those in the last four years. And sadly, and indeed tragically for many people, the one thing that we all have in common at the moment is that we are all, literally everyone across this country and indeed the world, living under the grim shadow of coronavirus. However, what has been said um, many times in, in things that I've attended recently is, whilst we are all in the same war, we're all fighting our own battles and they can be very different. I think the other analogy that I heard the other day was that we're all in the same sea, but we're all paddling different boats. And I think whilst we've got this one thing that is bringing us together with this shared experience, we've also got our very individual experiences within that. So in terms of the things that I've seen from a positive perspective, in terms of how we have been, been brought together during these tough times, um, you know, I'm gonna start with that. Joe and I were brought up to have a very positive glass half full approach to life. Um, so let's go there first of all. I mean, I think it's been inspirational and heartwarming to see the many examples and hear the multitude of stories of people helping each other and treating each other with kindness and compassion and real selflessness in recent times. From my perspective, that the local Joe Cox Foundation team have been a part of the response work across Kirklees, acting as an anchor between Kirklees Council and the voluntary sector, and the many brilliant mutual aid groups that, that popped up out of nowhere to help people in need. Um, whether it was delivering, delivering food or prescriptions, operating telephone befriending services with local partners, you know, this cross sector work, private sector involvement as well. We were very uh, lucky to be given some funding from businesses locally as well, showing this hugely impressive agility uh, of the third sector and, uh, and people within our communities to, you know, just get on with it and get stuff done. And indeed, it's often in a crisis that we see the very best of humanity. We saw it very personally when Joe was murdered, and we've certainly seen it in the last six months. And I'm sure we've all got those stories within our own communities and our own neighbourhoods of where people have pulled together. Um, nationally, for me, it's been hugely impressive to watch how many, so many organisations and individuals have adapted their work and activities. You know, we've all got used to virtual exercise sessions and singing and, you know, Zooming and um, Googling to within an inch of our uh, sanity. Um, but it's been brilliant to see that. And I think that's been, been really important in keeping people going. Through Joe's Foundation nationally, we run the Great Get Together campaign, which I, I think probably lots of people on the call tonight have heard of, encouraging people to come together in their communities through events based around food, sports, music or anything else where people can connect with others. So the challenge for us was how the heck do you do a great get together in lockdown? Hmm. We need to be creative, we need to be inventive. And that's what we chose to do. We didn't cancel. That's not what Joe would have done. That's not what we chose to do. So we threw lots of stuff online and we did things like the run for Joe, which we would normally do locally in Bristol. Uh, but we got people doing the run for Joe in 35 different countries across the world. And it was truly inspirational. So we still created a sense of togetherness even though we, we're physically apart. I don't like the social distancing expression. Yes, we are physically have to be distant, but we can still stay socially connected. And I think that's really important. We did an online community service where we got people from all different faith groups and, 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 and no faiths to come together. And it's been watched over 10,000 times um, on YouTube. And, and on the day we did it. We also encourage people to do these little acts of kindness in their communities. So whether it was jigsaw swaps or black plant swaps or baking or letter writing or sending postcards, you know, we were totally inspired by, by how much people embrace the great get together. And that's just one example. You know, there's, there's lots of that stuff that's gone on across the whole country. Uh, we did the Joe Coxway bike ride in July. We challenged people to cycle the circumference of the world. And again, people got on their bikes and did it. And we ended up cycling over 30,000 miles, creating a real sense of togetherness. So we've tried really hard to focus on how we can stay connected when we are forced to be physically apart. We also set up the Connection Coalition, which is a, um, a group of over 500 organizations now who have been sharing good practice about how we can enable people to stay connected. 
So there's lots of examples of ways in which people and organisations have supported each other. And, and, and that for me is, is brilliant. And, and, you know, it's kept me going um, in some of my darker days. But whilst I am an optimist, I am also a realist. And it would also be wrong to pretend that there's nothing to worry about in terms of things that might divide us. So, you know, very quickly, what I would say on that note is I think those early days of us all being in this together um, at the moment seem quite far away. Um, and in some ways, I think in recent weeks, we've seen that fraying around the edges. Um, I ran a, a more in common talk together session as, as part of this project last night. And sadly, there was a sense of division. There was a feeling that the country is divided. Interestingly, there was a sense of still connection and community at a very hyper local level within streets, within very local neighborhoods. But then there was a sense of more national division and actually within areas across the locality because of the different restrictions of lockdown that people did feel somewhat divided. And that was across a variety of lines, whether it was class, culture, age, you know, the, the, there were some fears there, there were some worries there. Also a lot of talk about blame, about judgment, you know, this, this thing about whose fault it is that we're in this position. I think that's, that's worrying and that's potentially quite divisive. And it's really important that we're exploring some of those issues tonight. So do I think COVID-19 will divide us in Yorkshire or anywhere else for that matter? Only if we let it. I think we've all got a role to play in making sure it doesn't. We've all got a role to play in pulling together in our own ways, in our own different boats, in this crazy sea that we're all sailing in. Um, and that's why I'm really proud to support the Talk Together campaign and events such as this. Thank you very much, Kim. Always inspires me. Thank you. Kim Ledbetter. Um, just a reminder of the question, and if you have, we're getting questions through now, if there's anything you'd like to ask our panel, then just click on the Q&A and type that in and we will sort that for you. Our second panel member this evening, so pleased that you could be with us, Dean. Dean Hoyle, who's the former chairman of Huddersfield Town FC, fat, sorry, founder of the Card Factory, uh, chairman of the retail chain The Works and trustee of the charity Leeds Cares. You're very welcome, Dean Hoyle. Oh, hello everybody. And like Kim just said, you know, thank you for joining the webinar. I'm sure you have plenty of choices this evening. I want to take it from a different angle. I think I want to take it from a, a business perspective, to be fair. I think um, it's hard to say, but if, I may be wrong in saying this, I may get a little bit of stick on Twitter, but I would say the first lockdown was a novelty not the novelty, it was like a novelty. And I think uh, winter's approaching and I think realism uh, and job losses are really starting to kick in. And I hope, well, I think firstly, um, we have to get through it. I don't think we have an option. Uh, the communities have to stick together. Um, there, there's blame games all over, um, but that isn't helping anybody whatsoever. I think from a business perspective, um, I suppose I, I found a card factory and I can comment on the works. Um, retail chains, unfortunately, we're facing um, uh, the brunt or the blunt end of this, um, this, this, this virus where high streets have been affected um, and job losses are, are widespread. You know, um, people are now starting to, to lose their jobs, not just in retail, but across the hospitality sector. I know of two people today who've lost their jobs. They've been made redundant. Um, and I think there's two things. I think there's people or there's businesses which are, um, they need to make changes. And I think there are businesses which are using this as an opportune moment um, or an opportune time to, to um, uh, reduce their workforce and make them very lean and mean. Um, so for me, if you look at, um, if, if you look at retail, what we are finding um, is it's a real hard slog to get people back to work. I, I honestly say it's a real, real hard slog, and it is. So I had a, um, um, a, um, um, a board meeting by Zoom, um, which isn't good, um, by Zoom on Tuesday morning, and I'm encouraging the team to go back to work, to start going back to um, the offices. And then I think 8 o'clock at night, Boris says, Right, forget um, um, uh, going back to the office. I want you to stay and um, uh, work from home. So there's mixed messages, but the government are in a really difficult, I believe, a really difficult situation and things are moving fast. So 
Um, but if you look at working, you look at business, unfortunately, as I see it now, a lot of businesses are saying, or employees are saying, I can work from home. I can work from home. And actually, I think people are quite enjoying working from home. But it's not sustainable. It really is not sustainable because you may be able to do your job from home, but the company cannot prosper by all your staff working from home and working remotely. You have to have that interaction. And if you look at the young people, so if a young person uh, starts a new job and they're working from home, they're trying to get on the career ladder, they've left university, how does that person get recognised? How does that person make an impression by Zoom or, or, or Microsoft Teams? It's really, really hard. So I think things have to get back to normal. And also you look at all those businesses which have been affected. So I've just been to London. I was absolutely gobsmacked by the ghost town and lack of tourism, lack of offices. I went to St. Paul's, to the top of St. Paul's. I'm looking at the, the, the city, the square mile. Offices after offices, nobody working in them, everybody working from home. And I also think, you know, communities cannot come together correctly if people are so divided and people working from home. I just don't, I don't see it. So I'm really hoping things get back to normal. If you talk football, um, then that's a real, um, really stuck in the mud. So just to let people kind of get their head out, it's like opening a shop. You can't um, get rid of your staff, which you've, um, um, uh, uh, the footballers, but unfortunately you have to pay all the, the wages. So footballers are um, um they're contracted so you can't not pay the, the wages of a footballer um but at the same time you're having no income coming through the gate um, but they expect football to carry on and they expect the chairman still to put their hands in their pockets as supporters so it's a real real tricky one so my um view would be from a business perspective is it's all good and well working from home and it's all good and well saying you know this is the new norm but I don't believe that new norm can continue with businesses prospering. And I also think there's going to be so much hardship and the unemployment figures are certainly, certainly going to rise. And, um, you know, I, 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 I'm probably more pessimistic because I think we've got to go in a really big trough before we come out and see any positives. Okay. Thank you very much, Steve. Sobering. If you're just joining us, you're very welcome. Thank you for being here. Our central question this evening is, will COVID cause division in Yorkshire or can we get through this together? Let's hear from our third and final panelist tonight. Um, and I'm so glad you're here, thank you. Uh, it's Hugh Mayam Islam, who's chairman of the Bangla Bantams, which is a Bradford City Football uh, Club supporters club. It's lovely to see you, evening. Uh, thank you. Um... Firstly, thank you for having me uh, today. It's a real privilege to be uh, part of this panel. Um, for me to start with, really, I'm, I'm really optimistic, really. For me is that um, we will get through this together. Of course we will. I think it's really, really important that we always look at how we can learn, be educated and get through this together. Um, for me, I'm part of um, uh, an organisation uh, which is a charity called Beep Clinic Partnership. And part of that is one of the projects is, is Bangla Bantams. So Beep as a whole, we had a charity. And what we did was for March, um, we had to change the way we deliver a number of projects. We uh, deliver different types of uh, initiatives uh, within the local community where uh, we had an older people's provision. We had an earliest project. We had a domestic abuse service and we had an indoor sports facility where there's lots of recreational sports, which everything obviously came to an end. What we had to do was um, look at uh, providing a travel helpline support and also providing um, a food provision. So what we did was uh, we went out to the local community um, and uh, provided cooked meals to, to, to all our projects, to the people. And also what it gives an opportunity was that we came together as a consortium with other volunteer sectors we linked in really, really well uh, with Bradford City, the community foundation, where we want to reach out to all the fans. We want to make sure the, the fans wasn't missed. Uh, we want to make sure that everybody, all the vulnerable people that needed their help and support 
would provide that support as much as we could. And the only way we could do that was coming together. So we, we created this consortium where everybody actually brought together so many different things. Some people brought cooked cook meals. Some people brought different types of meals where we shared that and into the community. And that was amazing. One amazing example for us was where we brought different faiths together. We had uh, the Muslim community coming together with the Hindu community where the Hindu community was contacting me saying, do you know what, we want to help. Let's, COVID, um, you know, it doesn't see any color. It doesn't see anybody, it affects everybody. We want to come together. So it was a real opportunity where we could come together and we should have done this before. Um, so we, um, during the, it was the Ramadan period where everyone were fasting, where they had to be at home. And it was a time where actually people should be coming together. They couldn't go out and pray together. So it was an opportunity where actually the Hindu temple actually dropped off lots of um, um, rice, chickpeas, tomatoes, all sorts of food, dates, etc. And then we cooked the meals and it went out to the Muslim community. And how amazing was that? The Hindu community providing the opportunity. We um, also, during those two festivals during that time, there was the Eid al-Fitr and there was Eid al-Adha during that time. Again, we came together where we tried to celebrate together um, as, as much as we can, where we provided um, um, food and special cooked meals during those two, two, uh, two, two celebrations. And it was just amazing. It was an opportunity to communicate. And what we did do was, was like anybody else's, we communicated a lot through Zoom, through, through telephone, and um, it really brought us together. What I would say also, the, the, um, where there was a lot of tension was when the Public Health Review came about saying that the Bangladesh community uh, are the highest risk of death and infection rates. Therefore, that did cause uh, a lot of, lot of um, discussion, uh, what that meant to them, uh, issues about health inequalities and how we can further support uh, the Bangladesh and the BIMI community as a whole. So these were issues that were raised, but for us it was how to raise them positively. For us, it led us to um, look at working more closely with the local authority. And that led us where at the moment now, um, we're looking at uh, providing home test kits to, to the community as well, where BIMI community, people that needed them, can contact us because we as a grassroots organization are the first point of call for, for, for the community where they can access it and there's that trust with us. And also give an example when we've gone out with the test kits, for example, it's not just about the test kits either. People want that reassurance. People want to, to talk and discuss. So for me is it's raised a lot of issues where, um, where are we go forward? A lot of people don't have the answers, but actually if anything, it's really brought us together and uh, for me, it's, it's changed our perspectives, a perspective in how we um, work together going forward as well. And for me, it's, it's shown that we can work together and we should work together. And um, we have, we've got all, what it shows to me is that it is really important that when COVID has happened, it's gonna change, well, it's changed the world and it's going to continue to change the world, but hopefully it will change the world uh, for the better, really. That's how I see it, as, uh, and that's as for us, and also as, as a fan of uh, Bradford City. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I just want to apologise again that Carrie Asim can't be with us. Uh, the is, is Imam of Leeds, the Mecca Mosque, Chair of Mosques and Imam's uh, National Advisory Board, he's on that, but he has got some family circumstances to deal with, and he sends his profuse apologies. Your questions are coming through to us, thank you. If you're just joining us, hello. Um, just use the Q&A or get in touch on um, any of the social media platforms where we currently are. I'm gonna take a question from Emma in a moment, but can I just ask you something as a panel? That this is like, it's been called an invisible enemy. And Dean said, Dean Hoyle said just a few moments ago, it was a novelty when we were all shut down and we were all clapping in the street and you know it was a bit like who do you think you're kidding mr hitler and all that went with it now i sense an enormous sense of confusion yeah. that we're not sure how bad it is. we know how bad it is when we look at the figures there's a lot of fear oh i don't think i dare do that and there's economic there's social there's faith there's community all of us working without a roadmap 
Now, we've been very positive this evening, and I think that's amazing. And there are days I feel fantastically positive. There are days I don't. Can I just ask you each briefly, what is your greatest fear at this point, given this invisible enemy of COVID? Kim? I think we've probably all got personal fears, and then we've got fears. I certainly have got fears for the country. Um, personal, I think we're probably all slightly scared for our loved ones, for people we care about, you know, and, and we've got people who are dismissive of the virus, dismissive of the situation, in denial about the situation. But when you've got family members and friends who've had COVID or are in high risk categories where basically they've been told that it will kill them if they get it that's a really harsh reality. And I've got people in my family and friends of mine who, you know, uh, my best friend had it. She's suffering from long COVID and just can't shake it off. It, it's, it's really real. So it scares me as a, as a disease, as a, as a condition. Um, so there's that level. And I'm also not one of these people that thinks, oh, I'm pretty young, I'm pretty fit and healthy. If I get it, I'll be fine. You don't know that. You don't know that. You could be that really unlucky, 40 something, 50 something, 20 something who gets it and as an absolute nightmare. So I've got my personal fears. Um, my fears as a country and as, a, as a, an organization, as a region, it, you know, I'm scared of this division. I am scared of this blame, of this judgment. And it's really hard because when things go wrong, we do want someone to blame. Um, as Dean alluded to, I, I do think communication needs to improve. I think the government started with a very clear comms message because it was very simple. Stay at home, don't go anywhere. Fairly easy, fairly straightforward. And that just as deteriorated and has been very confusing and at this moment in time is very confusing um, and I've had lots of conversations with people in, in the last 48 hours about that well can we do this or can't we do that where does it fit in and 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 then the the, the division at a local level so like really localized areas they've got additional lockdowns yeah. next to somewhere that doesn't yeah. and then and that's driving division well the posh people from that area better not you know better stay away from this area because this is where the numbers are going up and all that and it's horrible it's just a horrible way of living I'm worried about my friends and colleagues you know I've got kids I've got friends who teach all that so there's, there's a lot going on oh there is you know a lot, a lot going on so yeah, to definitely. pick one fear is probably too simple I've I know I'm oh, sorry I, I have so many too but thank you Dean you talked about the novelty value for many of us when lockdown began and how that is no longer novel and unclear I don't think it was. I, I don't think it was a novelty. I think we had the weather. Everybody's getting paid, um, and we all thought this thing may, or hope, we all hoped it would um, go away. Vaccine would appear, and we'll live happily ever after. But unfortunately, that's not what is going to happen. Uh, a big alarm for me is actually uh, Boris, Nicola and um, uh, Nicola Sturgeon and the Welsh Minister are all starting to agree with each other, which probably brings more alarm bells for me to think, well, there is something more serious going on. I think the biggest fear for me is if you go back 12 months, nobody, nobody would have ever envisaged that we'd all be working from home, we would be living in a state where the government's paying everybody's wages, blah, 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 but it's happened. So it's like on the morning you walk out of your door and you always the only the only the thing you can always rely on is the is the ground you stand on to be there. It's like it's always guaranteed, but nothing's guaranteed going forward. And COVID goes, we find the vaccine. What's next? Honestly, we just don't know what's going to happen. So for me, the biggest fear, obviously, individual health. Um, you know, we yeah, that, that's obviously really important. There's lots of there's lots of um, lives lost and, and also people who recover who are just not the same again. But the biggest one for me, Liz, is the hardship. And I'm, I'm probably glass half full, uh, half empty here. It's the hardship. It's the young people. It's the aspirations. It's looking forward to the future. You know, there's going to be so much hardship from people losing their jobs, family on the breadline. Um, you know, food banks, um, uh, house repossessions, it's going to happen and it's going to happen in the millions and it, it's happening now and it's not going to get any better and I just feel maybe in two or three years, the question people ask me is, when do you think it'll get better? Well, probably two or three years, four years, we're back to normal but it's the hardship in the dip and, it, and it's the problem with the dip and from that, 
I, I just think it's going to be turmoil. Uh, you know, it's okay, the government paying wages, paying this. All what they're doing is to try and keep people in the jobs until we get a vaccine and then we, we live happily ever after. But I'm not sure it's sustainable. You know, who's going to pay for the debt? You know, blah, blah, blah. You know, these are questions to be answered. But for me, I just feel as much for the younger end, their aspirations, they're our future, um, the aspirations, what they're going to do with their lives, you know, the jobs, the careers, it, it's just all up in the air. And I just think everybody likes security, don't they? We all like security in our life. We all like to feel secure. And I don't think I've ever lived through a time in my 53 years of living where there's been so much insecurity as, 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 as today. That's my view. Thank you very much. I've got uh, some of our questions are coming through, but I would like to get the greatest fear response because in many ways, if we face the fears, we know we can move forward or at least recognise them. Um, central question tonight is, will COVID cause division in Yorkshire or can we get through this together? Your greatest fear, Humayun, please, Humayun Islam from the Bangra Bantams. Yeah, my fear is, well, there's two really. Uh, what we do with that football and Bradford City? You know, if we, we can't go there, you know, it's just football and, you know, what would you do? What, what would your week be like? What would your weekends be like? And the other one is really, is the fake news. I think that seemed to travel so fast. You know, you've got so much fake news that's on, you get on your WhatsApp, you get it on Facebook and actually people believe them. And then that is my biggest fear when then everything is interpreted incorrectly. And that's why there's so many missed messages. So they're really two main things for me, really. Thank you very much. Um, we've got about another 25 minutes together, so I'd like to start going to some of the questions coming through from those who are sharing this debate with us this evening. Thank you for the questions. If you are watching on the webinar, use the Q&A button to post your question and then we will respond as we can. So this first question is from Emma. Hello, Emma. You say this. Today, DCMS shared the idea of sustaining community spirit through a Community Power Act, giving local people power over design and delivery of local services. What does the panel think of this idea? Kim. I think it's really interesting. We have a very positive relationship with DCMS through, through the Joe Cox Foundation. Um, and we've worked very closely with Baroness Diana Barron. Um, we've done a lot of work on loneliness, which has been really important coming through through the, the last six months as well. And I do feel that there is something very powerful and important about local decision making at this time. I think the response that we've seen um, in local communities has been extremely powerful and extremely important. And a lot of the examples that Humayan and myself have experienced show that. So I haven't had a chance to look at the, the, the Danny Kruger piece yet, but I'm gonna, we're going to have a look at that as a team over the next couple of days and look at some of the suggestions. But I do think there is something really powerful about local decision making, local pulling together, um, where you really know your communities, you really understand each other. You know, having again, having decisions made in London for, for communities like Batley and Spen and, you know, Bradford and, and, and Dewsbury and whatever, you know, it, it doesn't always work. So I think that's important. Um, I think the other point I would just make, which slightly refers to the previous question, but my other big fear, Liz, which kind of ties into this is mental health mental health and well-being that is one of the things I am really worried about and we're looking at setting up a local project around mental health and, and well-being and I think that can be done at a local level much more successfully and easily than it can at a national level. Thank you Kim. Dean then the idea of having a community power act of decisions being made locally your reaction to that? I, I think I think very, look, very briefly I think it's a really good idea and I think, um, like Kim just alluded to, you know, having people in Westminster making um, decisions about local, it, it, it just doesn't work. Um, I think it's bad enough when people, you know, when, when, when councillors in Huddersfield try and make decisions about uh, uh, Dewsbury, I think that's disconnected. So I always go back to the old, um, when I grew up as a kid uh, around the Spen Valley, um, I think it was even devolved then the, the local council and they had the Spen Valley Council and we had... Princess Mary running traps, Bembra Bass, blah, 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 a youth club. Um, and that's because they understood what the local people needed. So for me, um, the more you can bring the communities which you live in to make those choices of what they need, I think that's uh, all well and good, 100%. Thank you, Dean. And Humayun, your thoughts on having local responsibility for decision-making? 
Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with uh, Dean, what he just mentioned, really. And I think once it's localised, uh, the community will take ownership of it and they'll make the de best decision of what they want for their community and then they will listen and they'll listen to both parties then. Thank you. Questions are coming in, so we'll try and include as many as we can. So if your response is uh, not that I'm trying to shut you up, but no. <laughs> if they could be there, that would be lovely. Uh, good evening to Julie. She asked the panel this. I'm worried about the far right exploiting the fact that people are locked down at home to radicalise them. Can football clubs and communities do more to intervene in those online spaces to provide alternative viewpoints? Yumaya, let me ask you that before I go to Dean. Uh, they can do, but at the moment now, um, it's really important that a lot of the staff are furloughed. So therefore, coming in, when they're going to come in, when they're going to have impact. But definitely, I think, at some stage, uh, when there's staffing in place, we can look at a vision and see what uh, football can bring. And definitely, football is, for me, the best way in bringing communities together. And there's no better way, really, especially fan engagement. Dean? Yeah, you know, the Huddersfield, um, myself and Janet, we, we set up the Huddersfield Town Foundation. And... Uh, the community aspect has been fantastic. We are, uh, we are still are a, a fantastic community club, but when you start getting into uh, left wing, right wing football clubs intervening, I think that's something where we, as a football club, you shouldn't start. I think you've got to be intolerant. Intolerance um, level has got to be zero on things like racism. Um, you know, because let's be fair, you know, there's lots of um, uh, black footballers really make their mark within football. And we've got to be, um, you know, uh, really conscious of that and try and make the difference. I think football have been leading, especially um, uh, British football, uh, without question, when you compare that to the continent. But regarding uh, football clubs um, um, trying to intercept and try and work, you know, sort of the right wing, you know, is, is it right wing or I've got to be careful what I said. Is it right wing or left wing? I think I think there's problems on both sides. To be fair, um, but the football club, I, I think I would say it, it's the centre of the community, and we do fantastic community work, and it's a really good place to bring people together. But at the same time, um, what we can do and what football clubs can do is just feel feel the heat of the local area. Um, and, you know, it's a great place, you know, politicians, councillors, everything get involved in and make it a special place. So football clubs are not just about what they do on a Saturday afternoon, thank goodness. Um, it's also about what they can do in the community. And to me, the community aspect is, is as important as what they do on the field of play. Thank you, Dean. Kim, anything you'd like to add to those responses? Yeah, I think it's a great question from, from Julie. I think it was. We have to be really careful. And this is the thing going back to the whole fact that this situation is in danger of dividing us. It's going to pit communities yeah. against each other. And that is a breeding ground for extremism. And we need to be really careful. We've got a lot of young, vulnerable people at home on their computers and they are being targeted by extremist groups. That is the harsh reality of it. And we have to all step up. You know, mums and dads need to be looking at what is going on on their kids' computers. How are they being groomed? Because that's what's happening and that is what happens. So you've got to be really careful about that. Um, and I would broaden the discussion around football out into sports per se, because my background is in sport and physical activity and the power that it has to unite people and to bring people together with shared goals and a shared that's vision true, is yeah. huge. And we have to look at, you know, what is being done to save grassroots sport at the minute not much but like Dean says this isn't just about kicking a football around on a Saturday afternoon this is about the identity that it gives people the sense of belonging it gives people yes. the sense of togetherness it gives people you know because I've all you know I've said whenever you're running or you're playing sport whatever you're doing the differences don't matter because all you want to do is score that goal you want to get to the finish line you want your team to win so it's a really good level it's a really good thing the way to unite people so we do need to be looking at sport in our communities Thank you. Um, we're talking about whether COVID will cause division in Yorkshire and get through this together. And we're at the stage of this webinar where we're taking your questions. Thank you for everyone who's submitting. Let me get through as many as I can in the next 20 minutes or so. Sharon has messaged us. Hello, Sharon. She says, community spirit at the start of lockdown was inspirational. The challenge now is weariness, winter, negative media. People need positive things to look forward to, but how can we plan things 
when we can't physically get together. Dean, your response to that, please. <laughs> I missed the negative, aren't I? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, 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 to be fair, when you say you can't get together, you can't, you know, um, you know, where we live in, in, in uh, Kirklees, uh, I'm not allowed to meet my neighbour um, in the garden or, or have a coffee or so it's really, really difficult. And the other problem I think we have, and I know the weather affects me, um, we have winter coming up. So and then you've got newspapers picking up on the negatives. But the, the, there are so many negatives at this moment in time to pick up on. Uh, and I, I won't go over it again with, 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 with the economy. But there are positives. Um, and the positives are that we have to stick by the rules. Now, you know, I, I, I were a bit of an advocate for probably when, when uh, the Conservatives, um, um, uh, I vote Conservative, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Um, so I'm not bashing them but what i'm saying is i don't agree with everything they do so at the moment in time if you look at the conservatives they they um said right everybody's a lockdown and it's eat out to help out you can all go out all the kids are going back to university i speak i speak with experience they'll go partying and now we're back in lockdown again and it's the problem is you don't know what's going to happen so i really really hope now the positive i can take is we all know where we are um, we're in for a tough winter, uh, a really tough winter. Um, it's going to be socially disruptive. You know, we're not, we, we may not even be able to meet our loved ones at Christmas. That's a distinct uh, possibility and a distinct reality. So I hope that a uh, vaccine will be found. Uh, we'll get through this harsh winter. Um, it may be six months of our lives we, we want to forget about come, come, come next spring. Um, but we have to stick to the rules and that's all through all communities, all age groups. We have to stick to the rules and we have to try and um, uh, socially distance and get through this. Absolutely. hundred percent, because there is no other way. Otherwise, it's like a roller coaster. We'll be we'll be out and in and out and in. And nobody wants that, especially businesses. Business cannot cope with not knowing what's happening tomorrow. We need stability. So for me, we're all this together. We have to stick by the rules. Uh, the power makers in Westminster make the rules and we've got to adhere to them and, and as simple as that. Thank you very much, Dean. Kim, your response to Sharon's question. Allow me to provide some light to Dean's darkness. <laughs> <laughs> you know what we do. Listen, we've got to get through it. We've got to find a way to get through it. We've got to find a way to stay connected. It's, there's no two ways about it. It's going to be blooming tough, but we've got to find a way to do it. You know, I said before that we did the great get together in June that we do on what would have been Joe's birthday. We have a winter get together. Now, again, we're facing the same challenges, but let's go for this approach of what can we do? We can make a long list of all the things we can't do, or we can make a fairly short list but of the things that we can do. So let's find ways to stay connected during these tough winter months. I, I, you know, I'm under no illusion. I am realistic. It is going to be challenging. There's going to be all sorts of issues around the economy, mental health, you know, it, it, loneliness. It, it's going to be problematic. And that's why we have to pull together. So we will be doing the great winter get together through December and January. We're going to be putting stuff online. We're going to be doing stuff that people are involved with, um, you know, who are, who are digitally engaged. We're also looking up setting up a digital inclusion project to help people who are not digitally engaged. Let's get some tablets and some laptops out to people who are struggling. And let's also keep that community connection going on. Let's keep the, the acts of kindness going on. Okay, you might have to put an extra coat on, but go take some baking round to your neighbours. Pick up the phone. You don't need your coat on for that. Pick up the phone. Do keep those connections going. Keep that that strong, because you know it's happening. We've got to be realistic about that. You know the churches have done an amazing job. The mosques have done an amazing job. We've got so many grassroots community or, community organisations out there who have stepped up. Food banks. You know this is happening, and and so much of this is done. That's the other thing on a voluntary basis. You know, no one's getting paid for this stuff. They're doing it out of the kindness of the heart. So I think we need to keep the kindness going, the compassion going, and keep the resilience going. You know, we're going to have to do it. Yeah. Thank you, Kim. And let's get your point, please, Humaya, on that. Yeah. Um, Dark winters. Yeah. Yeah. So I totally agree with what uh, Kim, Kim has said. I think it's really important that um, 
we'd be as positive as possible. I think, thank God we didn't, we didn't lock down 20 years ago where we would have had a Nokia phone with limited uh, minutes calling people, we would have played Snake on, on, on the phone and, and that's it, you know, so it would have been a lot more difficult, you know, um, uh, 20 years ago. I think now we just look at all the positives, you know, there is WhatsApp video, there is ways of communicating and, and I think what's really important for me personally as well is using your faith to guide you. And the Muslim faith for me has given me that long-term aspiration, the long-term goals. And this is part of life. Sometimes you've got to think that we are going to be, we are going to struggle, but it's a time to reflect as well and look at yourself to see how we can become a, uh, become a better person, uh, uh, be part of the community, community where we can change and provide as much as we can during these times. So I think it's really important that we find um, uh, where we feel that we actually we are privileged. What I see again, personally for me is, I've been given an opportunity to be in the UK, for example, being a British Bangladeshi, for example, if I didn't, if my father didn't come to the UK from Bangladesh, I wouldn't have had all these privilege, privileges. I wouldn't have been part of, you know, I still say a fantastic, you know, emergency service. I can still contact the emergency service and they'll be outside my home. I feel safe at my home. All these positives that sometimes we forget. There's a benefit system where in Bangladesh, for example, there wouldn't have been. So for me, I just look at the bigger picture where actually I'm really privileged, I'm really lucky. But at this stage now, I need to just reflect a bit more, go through this struggle together, and I'm sure we're gonna come out, uh, out of this a lot positive together. Thank you very much. Uh, brief answers, if I may, just to try and get as many questions in before we finish at uh, seven o'clock this evening. This is a question from Nick. Good evening, Nick. You say some people don't have access to the internet, including some of those who are recovering from addictions, who are vulnerable and who are isolated. How can we help people who can't get online? D. A community spirit, you know, um, the simple thing is the alternative to online is actually visiting people face to face and seeing them. Um, I suppose the contradiction to that is if you're living in Kirklees, then that's not possible, is it? Because, um, you know, we can't meet anybody outside their household unless they're in your bubble. So um, I think it goes back to what Kim said, you know, I, I, I and I've just listened to the panellists, I am probably more negative, um, but... I think what does come out from 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 Kim is, is you know I hear this more, more all the time, is positivity and a can do attitude. You know, it's a real I can do this. It's a can do attitude, and I think community spirit, togetherness, put another coat on, meet people, see people, um, is fantastic. And the vulnerable, um, which I think there's going to be even more vulnerable people going forward. Um, we have to we have to really make sure we have community groups set up so if there's people who can't get on the internet they haven't got access it may be the most vulnerable um, there's something to do with the council where they can provide um services and i, I would have thought if there is a problem uh, there'll be groups or there'll be people in, in high positions who will um, 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 um acknowledge who these people are and identify them and whether it's um, you know, they have access, we give them access through the councils, um, or even so, there's more community groups set up to help these real, real vulnerable people. The, the shame what's going to happen, there's going to be even more vulnerable people, because like I said before, with job losses comes anxiety, comes depression, um, and, and everything else. So I, I feel there are ways around it, um, and I'm sure the people who are who are the powers to be who can identify who these people are, should go beyond the call of duty um, and dip into their reserves to make sure these people are connected. Because as we sit here now, the most vulnerable people in our society are the ones who are in the most need. Thank you, Dean. Kim, the answer to that question. Yeah, I, th I think, again, it's, it's got to be a two-pronged approach. I mean, and certainly I would agree with, with Nick, who asked the question, you know, people who have got addiction problems and other mental health problems associated with addiction, you know, this is really tough. Eating disorders, any sort of, you know, domestic abuse, anything where you are at home on your own with any sorts of issues around that is, is really challenging. So what I would say, A, to those people who are in that situation, please reach out and ask for help. 
I am dreadful at asking for help. Everybody who knows me will tell you that, but I've learned that it's a strength and not a weakness. So if you are struggling with any of those problems, find some help. There will be help out there. It might be just by contacting somebody in your neighborhood, knocking on your neighbor's door, saying, can you just give me a hand to get in touch with somebody? It might be going via, via the local council. Um, the digital inclusion piece, again, I think is twofold. It is, let's try and get those people online if they want to be online. I've got some um, friends of mine who are not remotely interested in being online, but if they want to be, let's try and get them online. There's a brilliant project in Leeds, which is all about digital inclusion. We're looking at that as, as a model for the for Kirklees to how we can get some funding and get some laptops out to people, get some training done for people. You know, I mean, it's been inspirational. Even my mum and dad are Zooming now, you know, that they're on there and, you know, it, they were nervous about it, they're apprehensive, but they're doing it, you know. So let's get some digital inclusion projects going. But again, as Dean said, let's also remember there is no substitute for that in-person human connection. Now that might have to be at two meters, but it's better than nothing. It might have to be in a park rather than your own garden, but it's better than nothing. So let's reach out to people. If you need help, ask for help. If you can provide help, give it. Don't be too nervous, don't be too shy. Reach out and help. Thank you very much, Kim. And you touched on being online if we'd have had to have this pre-internet. Um, but I'd be interested in knowing what your feelings are about that, how you get to help people who are not online, Humaya. Yeah, I, I think it's really, really difficult. But um, as part of one of our services is we provide a telephone helpline support and right at the early stages is um, a lot of the family members within the BME community, um, we actually reach out and we actually told them that this is what is uh, we're really important to have because we provide telephone support and where possible online support. So we actually had donations of smartphones that we actually gave out to some of our elderly group, which they utilised and used. But again, it is a really, really difficult for for definitely the elderly who are really isolated in uh, dispersed accommodation, having that uh, communication outside of, of their home. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to make this our final question. Um, this afternoon, this evening, because I think it touches on something that we all need currently, which is hope and positivity, even though I acknowledge absolutely the reality. And it, even if you think it's negativity coming from Dean, there has to be a balance between that in these very difficult times. And this question comes from Neil and he says this, hope is always stronger than fear. Can the panel share their most heartwarming examples of cohesion they've seen or heard over the last six months? So let me ask you that question, please. Do you mind? Yeah, I think um, for me, it's been amazing, which I touched on before, where different faiths have come together. So for me, it's been where during this difficult time, we've worked really closely with the, the Hindu community and the wider community come together, providing support uh, to to as many vulnerable families as, as possible and that has been through telephone support through food provision and, and just being there a, as a service and for me it's community cohesion sometimes is I think just spending time at home as well with your family I think for me reflecting back you know what I really love spending time I've got four children and you know what getting to know them better having those walks an hour with them and you know what then being, you know what for me that simplicity has been amazing for me is it's about making your home first and then you can, you know, go out into the community and make those real changes. So for me, ultimately, it's spending time with my wife and children. And that's been the most amazing experience, really, and learning from them as well. Thank you. Kim, you'll have seen many examples, I think, of hope. And yeah, I'm, I'm very you. fortunate. I'm very fortunate that I have, Liz. And, you know, for me personally, um, I could have easily lost all hope the day that Joe got killed. And I still have those moments where I could easily lose my faith in people. I could lose, lose my sense of, you know, wanting to carry on, but I don't do that because actually most people that I meet are really, really positive and really, really want, want the same as everybody else. They want to get on, they want to live in peace and they want to get on with their lives and do what's right for their family and their friends. And that gives me hope all the time. Um, you know, and that hope has carried me and, and, and mum and dad and, and our family through the last four years. So I'm not gonna let COVID-19 
make me lose hope. Um, uh-huh. you know, I've, come, I've come so far. And, you know, the stories, we, we did a, an event online last night with some, with some local people. And, and the first question I asked was, you know, OK, how's the last six months been for you? Because the other thing I think that's really important, which brings us back to the purpose of tonight, is talking. We have to keep talking to each other. And the question I asked last night was, tell us about the last six months. Tell us the, the bad bits, tell us the sad bits, but tell us the hopeful bits as well. And everybody had a hopeful moment, whether it was getting back in touch with relatives you've not seen for a long time, whether it was having time to reflect. I think you might have mentioned reflecting. This has been a really important period of reflection. What, do, what actually matters in life? What's important to us? So I think there are some real positives to come out of this, even though at times, and Dean's absolutely right, there's a lot of bad stuff as well. It's tough. It's very tough. But there is there is hope there. You know, stories of people who have connected. Well, lovely lady, I'll just tell you a very quick story. Linda, in her 70s, met a lady in her community who was deaf. This woman was having all sorts of problems trying to get help, trying to get assistant, assistance. Linda reached out to her. Linda is now an advocate for people um, who are deaf to try and get help for the local council. Um, you know, that, that story in itself keeps me going for another day. And there's dozens and there's dozens and they are out there. If you want to see some of them, there's the Connection Coalition website that I talked about earlier. They are out there. Um, so, so don't lose hope, anybody. Thank you. Final word then, Dean, on positivity. But stuff uh, that's warmed your heart. <laughs> you know something? I think there's been lots of incidents. Um, I think the biggest one is community spirit. I think um, there's lots of stories of um, uh, individually and collectively people doing wonderful things. But I also think it's a small and simple thing. It's going shopping for neighbours. But actually, it's not just shopping. It's the interaction and the neighbour who may be really elderly is looking forward to not you bringing them the shopping, but actually just chatting to them on the doorstep. And I think it's really important. I also think family and friends are the most important thing. Um, uh, connecting to people you probably haven't spoken to for a while, you know, distant relatives, distant friends, uh, in the social media now, um, you know, everybody, you know, most people are online and most people have the opportunity to reach out. It, it's simpler um, than, than, than writing a letter in the olden days um, or making a telephone call. It's simple and, and it's good. And I think there are lots of lots and lots of ways of community spirit out there. There really is. And I think it does give people hope, a lot of hope. Um, um, and hopefully when we come out of the dip and we're going up the, um, um, uh, uh, up the roller coaster to the top again, then hopefully people won't forget uh, when they get back on the treadmill, which I think everyone will have to do. Um, I hope people don't forget actually uh, what's warmed their hearts and given them the hope um, in the dark days. And if we can all take a positive from that, then, then, then fantastic. Thank you very much. So I'm going to draw this now to an end. Thank you for all the questions. My apologies, we had many that I didn't get to ask on your behalf, but you'll be able to comment on various forms of social media. Um, we've been talking about whether COVID will cause division in Yorkshire or if we can get through it together. And I think we've got a lot of work to do, whether we're mm. optimistic or pessimistic. Um, but remembering the good stuff, I think, is so important. And talking, which is what we've done. So I'd like to thank our panel who've given their time to us this evening and been just amazing. Thank you very much to Kim Ledbeater. Thank you very much, Dean Hoyle. Appreciate yeah. it. Nice to see you. And thank you, Humao and Islam. You carry on doing the good work. And again, our apologies and our thoughts are with Carrie Yassim who was not able to be with us this evening. I'd like to thank the organisers of tonight, British Future, the Think Tank, and of course, the big debate uh, talk together. Now, this webinar is going to be available on YouTube to watch at your leisure. If you've only just managed to join us. Please, please consider filling in the survey. Just go to together.org.uk and do that. Thank you for being here. I'm Liz Green. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.